So today we begin with the illimitables. The four illimitables, also called divine abodes, are loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. Now these four subjects of meditation are called in Pali Appamanya. So Appamanya comes from the word Appamana, that means no measure. No measure, no limit, no obstruction. That means when you practice one of these four, you take all beings as object. When you send meta thoughts to beings, then you send thoughts to all beings without exception. Since they must take all beings without measure, without limit, they are called appamanya in Pali. So I would prefer to call them limitless ones rather than illimitables. And they are also called Brahma Viharas. Now Brahma means divine or Brahmas and Vihara means dwelling or abode. So they are like the dwellings of the Brahmas because it is said that Brahmas live with these four subjects of meditation. So the mental dwellings of the Brahmas are loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. Now the first one, loving kindness, is the wish for the welfare and happiness of all beings. It is a wholesome wish, wholesome desire for the well-being of all beings. So it is love without attachment or love without craving. It is kind of love, but it is without attachment or craving. So it is the wholesome desire for the welfare and happiness of all living beings. And it helps to eliminate ill will, dosa. So if you have much dosa, then you can practice loving-kindness meditation. So practice of loving-kindness meditation can make you have less ill will or less dosa. And also when you practice loving-kindness meditation, you have to be careful of the near enemy. The near enemy is greed or attachment. Now you practice loving-kindness towards some person, and then you can be attached to that person. And so we have to watch that greed does not come in when we practice loving-kindness meditation. Sometimes greed is difficult to avoid because when you love a person, then greed or attachment also comes in. But when attachment comes in, then it is no longer uh, loving kindness. It has become an unwholesome uh, mental state. So when you practice loving kindness, be careful that you do not have attachment to the persons or to the beings you send thoughts to. So Mitta has one near enemy and one far enemy. Near enemy is greed and far enemy is ill will because greed can come to us unawares and affect our loving kindness. And the second one is compassion, karuna. Karuna is that which makes the heart quiver when others are subject to suffering. So when you see a being suffering and your heart quiver or your heart trembles, so it makes your heart tremble when you see somebody or some beings suffering. And it is the wish to remove the suffering of others. So compassion is the wish to remove the suffering of others. So when you practice compassion, you say, may all beings be free from suffering. 
or may all beings uh, escape suffering and it is opposed to cruelty now here also the compassion has grief based on home life as near enemy that means when you see someone suffering and if that one is dear to you you may also suffer you may also feel sorry uh, for him and so there can be grief uh, which is based on home life means based on worldly things and its far enemy is or opposite enemy is cruelty and the third one is appreciative joy is the quality of rejoicing at the success and prosperity of others so when we see other people in success or in prosperity we must be happy we must rejoice at their success and prosperity it is the congratulatory attitude and helps to eliminate envy and discontent over the success of others so if we have too much envy then we need to practice uh, mudita or appreciative joy and if when you practice appreciative joy you say may they not fall away from this success may they not fall away from this prosperity so in this way you send thoughts to them and mudita has joy based on home life as near enemy that means you become a joyful it is not appreciative joy you become happy with attachment or something with the person and so appreciative joy must not be associated with attachment or craving so there can be joy associated with attachment or craving regarding someone who is in success or in prosperity and so we must be careful not to get that kind of uh, joy and its far enemy is aversion like discontent over the success of others and the food is equanimity upika now this upika is different from the feeling upika so whenever you see the word upika please be careful or please be please find out whether it means equanimity or neutral feeling because both are called upika in the pali language so here equanimity is one of the 52 mental factors which is called specific neutrality equanimity as a divine abode is a state of mind that regards others with impartiality free from attachment and aversion so you do not like them you do not dislike them that is what is upika an impartial attitude is its chief characteristic and it is opposed to favoritism and resentment now in visuddhimagga it is explained that its near enemy is unknowing based on home life unknowing means ignorance a kind of ignorance connected with worldly things and its far enemy and there are two its far enemies are greed and resentment that means when you think of a person or something you may like him or like it or you may hate him or hate it but ubika is neither liking nor disliking neither loving nor hating this ubika is a very important factor a very important subject among the four um, brahma viharas because 
it is with uh, Ubeka that we balance the other three, Metta, Karuna and Mudita. Now it is important that when you practice Karuna, you do not fall into uh, grief or anger. Sometimes you see someone being uh, mistreated and then you are angry with those who afflict suffering on that person. So if you get angry, then you are no longer practicing compassion. You have fallen into akusala or unwholesome uh, mental states. So regarding those who are in distress, who are in suffering, in order not to get angry, in order not to grieve with them, we practice equanimity. When you practice equanimity, you say, beings have karma as their own property. So this is how you practice equanimity. That means we cannot help. It just happens according to his own karma. So my suggestion is do whatever you can to help people who are in distress or suffering. But when you cannot do any more, then you stop there and practice equanimity. That means, oh, oh, I've done what I can, and now it is beyond my power to help them, and they suffer according to their own karma, something like that. So these four are called limitless ones, and also called uh, Brahma Viharas. There are 52 Chetisikas and Mitta, loving kindness, is what we call Adosa, non-hate. So non-hate and loving kindness are the same and Karuna and Mudita are uh, as Karuna and Mudita among 52 Chetisikas. And then the last one, Upeka, among the 52 Chetisikas is in Pali, Tatra Majjatata, that is neutrality. And next one is one perception. The one perception is a perception of loathsomeness in food. Now, when we eat food, we must try to avoid attachment to food, greed for food. So in order to avoid attachment for food and greed for food, we have to make some reflection on the food and we have to make reflections on how we have to search for food, especially for monks, and then the repulsiveness of using it, and then the digestive process, excretion, and so on. So monks are trained to practice this perception or this sanya so that when they take food, they do not have attachment to food or greed for food. For many people it may be offensive because the food you eat, you, you never think of as loathsome. If you think of the food you are eating as loathsome, Maybe you cannot eat it. <laughs> but still, it is a good practice to avoid attachment to food and greed. Greed for food and also it can prevent overeating. So you can keep your weight down by practicing this perception. <laughs> so there are many ways of reflecting on this loathsomeness in food. So for monks, early morning they have to go out to collect food in the village. So early morning they have to get up, even if they do not want to get up, they have to, and then go to the village, stepping on everything on the road, uh, rocks and dirt and all these things. And also in the village also sometimes people are not so friendly to monks and so they may say words that are not suitable for monks and so on and also to come back to the monastery and then take the food 
with sweat and uh, all things and then chewing the food and swallowing it down and then it digests and until it leaves our body so these we have to reflect when eating so this is called one perception perception uh, actually notion of loathsomeness in food since we are trained to practice this and also monks are trained to make reflection on food when we eat like i take this food not to uh, beautify myself not to take pride in my body and so on so at one retreat i was served by a person he, he was an american so when he offer food to me he said pande enjoy the food <laughs> i was uncomfortable <laughs> so we are not to enjoy but we eat so that we can be alive and we are strong enough to practice what the buddha taught now the next one is called one analysis so this is the analysis into the four elements you already know the four elements huh? the element of earth water fire and air so our body is made up of the four elements and also some other material properties so the analysis into the four elements involves contemplating of the body as compounded out of the four great essentials the earth element as manifested in the solid parts of the body so you can take any part of the body and try to contemplate on the earth element in that part of the body and the water element in the bodily fluids the fire element in the body is heat and the air element is the breath and vital currents so you sit down and then you try to see these elements in different parts of the body like head hair body hair nails teeth skin and so on and it is for getting rid of the notion of compactness for getting rid of the notion of a being of a man of a woman now in the mahasati patana so the buddha gave a simile that a man after killing the cow was sitting at the cross roads and that means when that man takes the cow to the slaughtering place and when he uh, kills the cow and when he cuts the cow into pieces during those times he still has the notion that it is a being it is a cow but once he cut the cow into different pieces and he put the pieces on the table like this and for sale he loses the notion that it is a cow now it is just meat so at that time he knows that he is selling not the cow but the meat and people are buying meat from him so in the same way when we are able to see our bodies as just composed of these four elements earth element water element and so on we lose the notion of a being in ourselves so it is also a very powerful subject of meditation and also it is Uh, to get rid of attachment to our bodies and to get rid of a notion of a soul or a person and it is also very useful in many ways one thing taught in visuddhimagga for getting rid of resentment is to use this analysis into four elements so when you are angry with somebody you analyze him into four elements and ask yourself whether you are angry with the earth element or the water element in him if you can really 
analyze him into these four elements and ask these questions, then your anger will have no footing, and so it will disappear. So it is very powerful subject of meditation, and it is very useful even in our daily lives. So next time when you are angry with somebody, you can just ask yourself, am I angry with the earth element in him, or water element in him, and so on. And also, when you analyze yourself into four elements, you see there are these four elements only and nothing else, like a person or a soul. So it is useful in getting rid of the notion of a soul, a person, or an individual. The next is the immaterial states. Now, up to one analysis, many of these subjects of meditation can lead one to attainment of material jhanas, rupa vajra jhanas. Not all of them, but some of them. Now, we come to the immaterial states the subject of meditation called immaterial states. And the four immaterial states are the base of infinite space and so forth. Now you already know these four from the first chapter. So in the first chapter, there are what are called immaterial types of consciousness. So they have long names in Pali and also in English. So to be brief, the one is the base of the infinite space and number two is the base of infinite consciousness, three is the base of nothingness and four, base of neither perception nor non-perception. So these four are called the four immaterial states. The other will explain some of them in in some more detail later. So up to this we've finished the 40 subjects of meditation. Now, analysis of suitability. Which subject of meditation is suitable for which type of person? Now with respect to temperaments, the 10 kinds of foulness and mindfulness occupied with the body, that is meditation on the 32 parts, are suitable for those of a lustful temperament. So if you think you are of lustful temperament, then you can pick up one of these subjects of meditation and practice meditation on them. Ten kinds of foulness, that means the different stages of the corpse, You take one of them as object and then practice meditation on it. And also, mindfulness occupied with the body means meditating on the 32 parts of the body, seeing the 32 parts of the body and then trying to see that each part is loathsome, each part is foul, each part is not beautiful. So for those who have lustful temperament, these subjects of meditation are suitable. And the four illimitables and the four colored casinas are suitable for those of a hateful temperament. So if you get angry easily, then you practice one of the four limitless ones or one of the four Brahma Viharas. And also you can practice the four colored casinas. Blue, yellow, red and white. So when you see color, your your mind becomes calm. So you can get rid of hate by looking at colors or color casinas. So the four limitless ones and the four colored casinas are suitable for those of a hateful temperament. Mindfulness of breathing is suitable for those of a deluded and discursive temperament. Mindfulness of breathing, because you try to be mindful of the breathing at the tip of the nose, in, out, in, out, in, out, and this helps you to get rid of 
delusion or ignorance and also thinking, discursive temperaments mean much thinking, vitaka. So if you think too much and you want to calm your mind down, then you practice mindfulness of breathing. The six recollections of the Buddha and so on, the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, morality, devas, peace. So these recollections are suitable for those of a faithful temperament. So if you have faith, they are suitable for you, recollection of the virtues of the Buddha and so on. Recollection of death, of peace, the perception of loathsomeness in food, and the analysis of the four elements are suitable for those of an intellectual temperament. So if you want to say you are of intellectual temperament, try one of these subjects of meditation. The analysis of the four elements. So you need intellect to be able to analyze your body into four elements, and you need intellect to recollection on death. Now, recollection on death is also a powerful type of meditation, but you need to be intelligent, you need to be wise, because everybody is afraid of death, and so when you do recollection on death, you may become afraid. Or sometimes when you recollect of death of a hated person, you may become happy. (laughs) (laughs) Or when you recollect death of a loved one, you will become sorry and so on. So you should be very balanced when you practice the recollection of death. And recollection of peace means recollection of the peaceful nature of Nibbana. Nibbana itself is a very difficult and subtle object and so the Attributes of Nibbana as peaceful are also of a profound nature and so you need intellect, you need understanding, you need wisdom to practice these kinds of meditation. All of the remaining subjects of meditation are suitable for all temperaments. So the, the remaining subjects of meditation are suitable for any of the temperaments. But there is one note. Of the casinas, a white one is suitable for one of deluded temperament. A small one for one of discursive temperament. So when you make a casina disc, and if you are of a deluded temperament, then a white one is suitable because your mind has more room to dwell on the object. But if you are of a discursive temperament, if you think too much, then it is important to have just small area for your mind to keep on. So in that case, a small casino disc is suitable. Nowadays, people practice mindfulness of breathing meditation and teachers just uh, teach everybody who comes to them to practice mindfulness of breathing meditation or other types of meditation and then there is a criticism that people have different temperaments and why is this teacher giving just this one type of uh, meditation to all who come to him but it is explained in Visodhimaga. All this has been stated in the form of direct opposition and complete suitability. Now, here it is said that, say, the ten kinds of foulness, meditation, and mindfulness occupied with the body are suitable for lustful temperament. So that is said in the form of direct opposition because they are direct opposite of the temperament 
and they are completely suitable. But there is actually no profitable development, that means mental development, that does not suppress greed, etc., and help faith and so on. So actually, you can practice any type of meditation. But if you know that you have such a temperament, then you may choose more suitable one for you. So if you do not know of what temperament you are, you can just take one of these 40 subjects and practice. And this is said in the Megiya Sutta. So in one Sutta, Buddha said, one should in addition develop these four things. Foulness should be developed for the purpose of abandoning greed or lust. Loving kindness should be developed for the purpose of abandoning ill will. Mindfulness or breathing should be developed for the purpose of cutting off applied thought, that means cutting off thinking or distractions. And perception of impermanence should be cultivated for the purpose of eliminating the conceit I am. So here Buddha was teaching four kinds of uh, meditations to just one person. And also in the Rahula Sutta, in the passage beginning, develop loving kindness Rahula. Seven meditation subjects are given for a single temperament. Buddha was once giving meditation subjects to his son Rahula, just one person. But Buddha said, Rahula, uh, practice loving kindness meditation, practice compassion and so on. And so there are as many as seven subjects of meditation given to just one person. So if you know that of what temperament you are and you can choose a suitable subject of meditation, well and good. But if you don't know, then any subject of meditation can be practiced because there is no mental development that does not suppress greed and so on and that does not help faith and so on to grow. Now you can read this in this book, The Path of Purification, Visodhimaga, the translation of Visodhimaga. Please do not be afraid of this book <laughs> because it's it's more than 800 pages. <laughs> so, it is third chapter, paragraph 122. I think you can get even this book free from, from some place. So it, it is published by Singapore Buddhist Meditation Center. Maybe this is for free distribution. Okay, this is the suitability. So if you can choose the suitable one, it is good. But if you cannot, any subject of uh, meditation is good for you. Now we come to analysis of development. Actually, three kinds of development. Preliminary stage of development is attainable in all these 40 subjects of meditation. So, in all these 40 subjects of meditation, there can be the preliminary stage of development. When you first practice a subject of meditation, you are in the preliminary stage. So, preliminary development can be had in all these 40 subjects of meditation. In 10 subjects of meditation, the 8 recollections of the Buddha and so forth, the 1 perception and the 1 analysis, only excess development is attained. Only neighborhood development is attained, but not absorption, not jhana. So the 8 recollections beginning with the recollection of the Buddha. And then one perception, that is perception of loathsomeness and food, and one analysis, analysis into four elements, they can lead only to excess development or neighborhood development, and they cannot lead to absorption. They cannot lead to attainment of jhana. 
So if you want to attain jhana, you do not practice these ten. So recollection of the Buddha will not lead you to attainment of jhana. It can lead you only to attainment of what is called neighborhood or excess concentration. In the 30 remaining subjects of meditation, the absorption stage of development is also attained. So the other subjects of meditation can lead you to excess development as well as the absorption development. So if you want to get jhana, then you avoid practicing recollection of the Buddha and so on, the ten subjects, but practice other subjects like kasina meditation and so on. Now, recollection of the Buddha and so on cannot lead to absorption, cannot lead to jhana because Buddha's attributes are many. So you have to be mindful of many things. It is so. Bhagavad Araham, Sama Sambuddho, Vijja Charana Sambano, Sugoto, and so on. At least there are nine attributes of the Buddha, and you have to be uh, recollecting all these nine one by one, one by one. And so there are many different things to recollect. And also, each one attribute of the Buddha is very profound. And so, because it is profound and because the attributes are many, your mind cannot reach the stage of jhana, or your concentration cannot reach the stage of jhana. So it will only reach the stage of neighborhood concentration. And the same with uh, perception. Since you have to take many things as objects, it cannot lead you to jhana uh, concentration and also one analysis, they cannot lead to attainment of jhana. The other study can lead to attainment of jhanas. Now for this information, you can again read the Visodhimaga. If you are interested, I want you to write down the chapter and paragraph numbers. So chapter 7, paragraph 66, 87, 99, 105, 113, 117. And chapter 8, paragraph 40, and chapter 11, paragraph 25 and 44. You can read those paragraphs for the reasons why these subjects of meditation cannot lead to jhana concentration. Now, 40 subjects of meditation by way of jhana. That means which subject of meditation can lead to which jhana. Now, the 10 kasinas and mindfulness of breathing produce five jhanas. That means you can attain all five jhanas by the practice of ten kasinas and mindfulness of breathing. So if you want to reach all five jhanas, then you choose the kasina meditation or mindfulness of breathing meditation. The ten foulnesses and mindfulness occupied with the body, only the first jhana. So they can lead to the attainment of first jhana only. The ten foulnesses and mindfulness occupied with the body. Now for these subjects of meditation, the object is very gross. And you have to look at the corpse. And the corpse bloating and cut to pieces and so on. And so since the object is gross, and also the 32 parts of the body, uh, you have to recollect on the loathsomeness of these 32 parts of the body, and so the object is also gross. So when the object is gross, you need vitaka, you need initial application for your mind to be on the object. 
that is why you can attain only first jhana with these um, subjects of meditation. You cannot reach second jhana because second jhana has no vitaka. That jhana has no vitaka and so on. So you need vitaka to keep your mind on the object. So it is compared to using a pole to keep the boat steady in a strong current. So when the boat is in a strong current, then you need a pole to keep the boat from being carried away by the current. So they can lead only to first attainment of first jhana. The first three limitless ones such as loving kindness lead to four jhanas. You practice loving kindness meditation and you can reach first, second, third and fourth jhana, not the fifth. And you practice compassion, you practice sympathetic joy and you reach one of the four jhanas. Because when you practice loving kindness and so on, your mind is happy. Your mind is accompanied uh, by what is called somanasa or happiness. But the fifth jhana is accompanied by neutral feeling. So you cannot reach fifth jhana by the practice of loving kindness, compassion and sympathetic joy or appreciative joy. And then equanimity can lead you to the attainment of the fifth jhana only. Because it is accompanied by neutral feeling. Thus, these 26 subjects of meditation produce fine material sphere jhanas. So they produce rupa vajra jhanas. The four immaterial states produce immaterial jhanas. So if you want to attain immaterial jhanas, then you practice the four immaterial states. And these four immaterial states can be uh, practiced only after you have gained the five jhanas. Now, the analysis of terrain, actually the analysis of the signs. Now, you remember the three signs mentioned at the beginning of uh, this chapter? Section 5 on page 331. So three signs should be understood as preliminary sign, the learning sign, and the counterpart sign. Now, this is some information about these signs. Of the three signs, the preliminary sign and the learning sign are generally found in relation to every object in the appropriate way. That means you can get the preliminary sign and you can get the learning sign when you practice any one of the 40 subjects of meditation. But the counterpart sign is found only in the casinas, foulness, the parts of the body and mindfulness of breathing meditation. So counterpart sign can be obtained only through the practice of casinas, ten casinas and foulness of the body meditation and the parts of the body meditation and mindfulness of breathing meditation. It is by means of the counterpart sign that excess concentration and absorption concentration occur. When you get the counterpart sign, your mind is said to have reached uh, the excess concentration level and you practice farther and then you get absorption or jhana uh, concentration at jhana level. So the counterpart sign is an important one. If you do not get the counterpart sign you cannot hope to get even excess concentration or neighborhood concentration. Neighborhood means neighborhood of jhana. Now the appearance of signs in meditation. From now we come to the real practice of meditation. 
when a beginner apprehends a particular sign from the earth, this, etc. That object is called the preliminary sign. So when a person begins to practice and take the say disc as an object and practice meditation on that disc, then that object is called a preliminary sign. Because this is the object he takes during this stage of preliminary development. And that meditation is called preliminary development. Now here uh, the subcommentary gives some instructions for the preparation to practice meditation. To practice meditation, yogis have to make some preparations. The mundane concentration should be developed by one who has taken his stand on virtue that is quite purified in the way already stated. So that is the first thing a yogi has to do before he practices meditation. As a preparation for the practice of meditation, the first thing he must do is to stand on virtue that is quite purified. That means to have the purity of virtue, purity of sila, purity of moral conduct. So when or before you practice meditation, you have to purify your sila. And how long must you be purified in sila before you practice meditation? One month or two months? For lay people, to achieve purity of a sila is not difficult. They just need to take precepts. You say panati pata vera manisi kapadang samadhi ame and then keep them and then your moral conduct is said to be pure. You don't have to worry about your moral conduct in the past whether it was pure or not. But before practicing meditation you take the precepts and keep them and you are said to be pure in moral conduct. So you can practice uh, meditation uh, without worry, uh, without remorseful feeling. So it is easy for lay people to achieve purity of moral conduct. But for monks it is a little difficult because you know monks have to keep many rules. How many rules? 227. They are just fundamental rules. There are many more. Okay, <laughs> And also there are different kinds of offenses. Say we break one rule and then we come to one kind of offense. We break another rule, may we, maybe we come to another kind of offense. And to get rid of that offense, we have to do something like confession. So confession is easy. You just confess to another monk and that's all. And confession in Buddhism is just telling that you have done something wrong and then in the future uh, you will refrain from doing it again and just that and the other person say okay it is good to confess and don't do it in the future something like that but not like confession in Catholicism there you will be released from your sin yeah? <laughs> so here just we declare uh, our transgression to another monk and that's all. But there is another kind of offense that needs not just confession but we have to give up the thing involved in this also. Like we buy something with money. We handle money and we buy the thing with money. Then we come to offense. And in this case we have to confess and also we have to give up the thing involved. And there is another kind of offense that needs monks to stay on probation for as many days as he uh, covers up his transgression. If he covers for 100 days then he must be under probation for 100 days. If he conceals his uh, offense for 
10 years, then he would be under provision for 10 years. So, and then it needs Sangha to take him back into the fold of Sangha. So it is a little difficult. It is difficult for monks to achieve purity of moral conduct. But lay people, you are very fortunate. <laughs> huh? So you just take precepts and then you are pure in moral conduct. So that is why at the retreats, we make yogis take precepts every day. But precepts taken once will be with you for as long as you decide to keep. Actually, you don't have to take precepts every day, but it is good to take precepts every day, reminding you of what you have to refrain from and also reminding you of the purity of uh, your sila. So first, you do that before you practice meditation. And then you should cut off the ten impediments that you may have. There are what are called impediments, some obstacles to your practice. I cannot go in detail about all this. So I will always refer you to Visodhi Maga. <laughs> so you have to sever the ten impediments. For example, a dwelling place. Sometimes a dwelling place is an impediment for a monk. If he has to take care of the dwelling place because it is too old or because it is too new and there are something to repair and you have to do the repair and so on, then you don't get time for meditation. So such a dwelling place is an impediment for that person. So he must avoid that or he must go to uh, another place, something like that. So you must cut off ten kinds of impediments so that you can practice meditation without obstructions. And then approach a good friend, the giver of a meditation subject. So you must find a teacher, a meditation teacher who will teach you meditation. And then take from among the 40 meditation subjects that is suitable for your temperament. So you choose a subject of meditation with the help of a teacher. After that, he should avoid a monastery unfavorable to the development of concentration and so on. There are many kinds of places that are not suitable for meditation. When the let's say monastery is new, when it is old, when it is close to a highway and so on. So the place where you practice meditation should be quiet, secluded, and not crowded and so on. So you have to choose this also. Then he should cut off the lesser impediments. <laughs> so two kinds of impediments, larger impediments and lesser impediments. That means if your nails are long, then you should cut them. If your hair uh, is long, you should cut. If your clothes are dirty, you should wash them and so on. So after cutting off the lesser impediments, then you can get into the practice of meditation. So this kind of uh, preparation a yogi must make. Suppose a yogi has done all these preparations and also he has made for himself a casino disc. So, when a beginner apprehends a particular sign from the earth disc, etc., that object is called the preliminary sign. So he sits down and looks at the earth disc and then he puts his mind on the whole of the disc and then says to himself, earth, 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 many times sometimes with his eyes open and sometimes with his eyes closed. So during that time, that object or that sign is called a preliminary sign and his mental development at that time is called preliminary development. When this sign has been thoroughly apprehended and enters into the range of the mind door just as if it was seen by the eye, 
That means when you have thoroughly memorized that this and you can see it in your mind, you can see it with your eyes closed or you can see it even though it is not in front of you. So when you can see it in your mind like this, when you have thoroughly memorized it, then it is called the learning sign. Now, the word learning sign, I prefer another word. You may say learned sign, not learning sign. The sign that is learned, or the sign that is memorized, or the sign that is grasped. So a grasped sign, or a learned sign, or memorized sign. So when you can see the casino disc in your mind like that, then that image in your mind is called a learned sign. Or in Pali it is called Uggha, U-G-G-A-H-A, Uggha Nimitta. And that meditation becomes concentrated. That means now your concentration has become better because now you can see the sign even with your eyes closed. When one is thus concentrated, one then applies oneself to meditation by means of that preliminary concentration based on that grasped sign. That means you take that grasped sign and then practice meditation on it saying uh, 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 again and again. As one does so, an object which is the counterpart of that grasped sign becomes well established and fixed in the mind. So that means that memorized sign, you concentrate on that memorized sign, and now that memorized sign becomes well established and fixed in the mind. Now that means it becomes more refined. During the time when it is the grasp sign, the grasp sign or the learned sign is a exact replica of the disc. When there are some flaws or blemishes on the disc, then the learned sign has those blemishes. Suppose there are impressions of fingers on the earth disc, then the learned sign has these impressions. So it is like photocopy of the, the disc with its blemishes. But when it reaches the stage of counterpart sign, these blemishes disappear. And so it appears to him as smooth and shining. So it is explained in Vizodimaga as it appears as if breaking out from the uh, learned sign and a hundred times or a thousand times more purified. Like the moon's disk coming out from behind a cloud. So the sign, first it was a learned sign and so it is the exact replica of the earth disk. Now you practice meditation on that sign, seeing that sign in your mind, and then that sign becomes more and more pure, refined, and it is fixed in the mind. So when it is fixed in the mind, free from the flaws of the original object, it has become a counterpart sign. And that counterpart sign is called a concept. It is not a reality. Reality is the earth casino. Now this is the image of the earth casino, mental image of the earth casino, and so it is not a ultimate reality, but it is a concept. And it is born of meditation. It is produced by your meditation. So that object is called a counterpart sign. Okay, let's have a break.